Good morning, and welcome to this, this year's fellow session, Emerging Themes and Methods of Humanities Research. With all the, the riches of our newly reconfigured annual meeting, this opportunity to get a sense of the lively, textured, imaginative, and consequential scholarship being pursued by ACLS fellows remains for me the high point of the meetings. It answers to, for me the question of why we do what we do in ACLS, or to turn back to Pauline Yu's address earlier this morning, another reason we're here, and a very good one indeed. I'm Don Brennis, I'm an anthropologist at UC Santa Cruz and a member of the ACLS board. And it's my pleasure to introduce today's three speakers and to moderate what I, what I trust will be a lively general discussion. The, <coughs> I want to point out a couple of common threads across these three presentations. The first of which is that there's a very strong common digital thread. Our first presenter, who unfortunately is going to have to be with us virtually in absentia, but perhaps appropriate to the digital nature of her, of her project, is working specifically in digital-born uh, production. The second is working, the second of our speakers is working on putting together, among other things, a, a guide to the mysteries of early forms of Zapotec transcription, and of that, through that, to the mysteries of Zapotec grammar. And though I don't know how much it's going to figure in his discussion today, our third speaker is also working on the computer recognition and identification of cursive styles in the uh, area, the Aramaic dialect of Syriac and other, other scripts. So one thing that pulls these papers, these presentations together has to do with their strong digital thread. The other is, has more to do with the process of scholarship rather than in some ways the topical substance, and that is that all three of the presenters today are deeply entangled and generatively entangled in highly collaborative collectivist projects of really providing with, in the company of other scholars, providing for each other and for a broader scholarly community and one that reaches beyond the academy, certainly to, to indigenous Zapotec scholars in contemporary Mexico. Um, resources for doing scholarship of real consequence. And in doing so, our three colleagues here really model scholarship at its best. Individual, imaginative, and working towards a common conversation and common benefit. Our first speaker, who because of her son's illness, unfortunately has to be with us electronically, is Kim Gallen, who's assistant professor of history at Purdue. She has her PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania, and she received the 2015 Digital Innovation Fellowship, one of the diffs to which Pauline referred this morning, for her work on the Black Press Born Again, excuse me, the Black Press Born Digital Project, which is involved in creating a series of four peer-reviewed Born Digital volumes, looking at the historical archives of black journalism from the 19th and 20th century, and focus on the four topics of transnationalism, the short story tradition, political cartoons, and children columns. So the three of us will move to the audience where we also can hear Kim, and let's turn it to Kim Gallen. Good morning. My name is Kim Gallen, and I'm an assistant professor of history at Purdue University a visiting scholar at the Center for Africana Studies at Johns Hopkins University, and a proud 2015 ACLS Digital Innovation Fellow. Thank you for allowing me to be here this morning, or I should say here in Indiana this morning. Unfortunately, I'm unable to be there with you today in Arlington due to my son um, taking ill um, recently, making it difficult for me to travel at this moment. So I appreciate your flexibility and allowing me to come to you today through a video recorded presentation. I also want to thank the ACLS for their support and their, um, their ability to see the vision that I had for this project and give me the opportunity to work on an incredibly important topic in not just African American history, but in American history, the black press. I also want to thank the NEH for providing me with a digital humanities level one startup grant in 2000 
and 13, 14 to develop a workshop to think and to conceptualize the visualization in the black press. And that's where this idea for the black press born digital was developed. So I wanna thank my colleagues for working with me on that idea. I also wanna thank Purdue University for believing in me as a junior scholar, supporting my digital work, making me, uh, assuring me along the way that my work is worthy of being accounted and supported and being a part of my ability to, um, to move from a junior scholar to a, a senior scholar. And I, I appreciate their, their support in that, in that sense. I want to start off this morning by talking just very briefly about the black press. Um, just a snapshot of, of what I mean when I talk about the black press and its significance. Literary scholar Henry Louis Gates states that the history of the black press, quote, is almost a self-contained universe of thought and feelings of the African American people, their aspiration and dreams, but also their everyday concerns and occurrences, end quote. From its inception in 1827, the black press has been instrumental in reinforcing the democratic ideals on which American society was founded. The term black press refers to serial print newspapers published by black owned businesses and represents one of the most radical newspaper traditions in the United States. And so what you see in front of you is images that reflect the history of the black press and its strong, strong tradition in black communities across the nation. Recognizing the significance of the black press, 20th century scholars undertook the arduous process of looking through bound volumes of newspapers, then microfilm film reels to recover the history of African-American newspapers. In fact, I started my research uh, uh, my dissertation on microfilm. I even had purchased a microfilm off of eBay so that I could look at microfilm on my downtime at home. And as a former librarian, I, you know, I had access to, to the microfilm so that I could bring it home. But fortunately, 21st century scholars like myself have the luxury of digitized newspapers and full text searching electronic databases. Yet despite the presence of digitized newspapers and digitized research, scholarship on the black press remains limited. Thus a large gap in open access digital resources and scholarship exists in the black press for two reasons. One, the lack of access. The, the access to digitized newspapers still is hampered by paywalls and subscriptions that can be quite expensive for institutions and almost impossible for individuals to uh, attain. And then two, the absence of digital projects on the black press. There has yet to be a full scale digital project on the black press, although we see uh, more and more um, efforts to, to change this. Nonetheless, these factors make it difficult for scholars to conduct research and students to learn about the history of African-American newspapers. Again, the cornerstone of the black community writ large. In the digital era, students and scholars should expect to locate scholarly resources on the black press that live exclusively online. At the present moment, they cannot. Although, as I just mentioned, we do see efforts to change this. I wanna mention one project, Matt Delmont, whose project, The Black Quotidian, The Everyday History of African American Newspapers, documents the history of African Americans um, by posting images from black newspapers. And he's, he's done this uh, recently every day and tweets and posts these uh, images, which are incredible images to, to look at. I, I encourage you to take a look at his site. Again, it's Matt Delmont, The Black Quotidian. The Black Press Born Digital Project also, like Matt Delman's project, works to transform digitized newspapers into coherent and innovative narratives that create a deeper significance of the history of the Black Press. 
This project, in its broadest sense, seeks to create innovative digital scholarship and resources on the Black press. But more specifically, the Black Press Born Digital Project produces four short, peer-reviewed, open access, and searchable born digital books on transnationalism, the short story tradition in the Black press, children's columns in the Chicago Defender, and political cartoons in 19th uh, and 20th century uh, Black newspapers, 19th and 20th century na uh, Black newspapers. The Black Press Born Digital Project books will each feature PDF images from digitized Black newspapers indexed in accessible archives, a ProCrest historical newspaper database, and from digital scans of physical copies of newspapers. But unlike ebook projects, which digitize conventional print books, the Black Press Born Digital uh, Project will design and create interactive and multimedia born digital books that are originally and solely published in a digital format. So in this sense, born digital books, Black Press born digital books, are not surrogates for print books. The Black Press Born Digital Project instead will animate the invaluable role that the Black Press has historically played in American history and foster a cadre of new work on the Black Press. Now this is what makes, I would argue, this project really innovative, although we are seeing more and more efforts, namely from Mellon and NEH, and again, the American Council for Learned Societies, to create born digital scholarship, scholarship that exist and is born exclusively in a digital realm. And I think the idea behind that is that to create something in the digital realm, solely in the digital realm, again, not to create a version of something, but to create something new, uh, lends itself to a level of creativity and originality that um, creating, a, again, a digital version doesn't necessarily lend itself to. And I, I'll come back to that in a few minutes as I talk more specifically how we envision these books and what we hope they can do for, for audiences. Now, my work builds upon my, my organization, the Black Press Research Collective, which is an interdisciplinary group of scholars committed to generating digital scholarship about the historical role of Black newspapers. The BPRC and, uh, has received a, a, a couple of grants, including the ACLS, to develop this scholarship. Um, and what we're hoping to do in this project is to draw on the concept of e-publishing cultivated, cultivated by ACLS Humanities eBook Project and the Gutenberg eBook Projects. Both of these projects have been committing, committed to producing e-monographs and making them accessible online. Um, the Gutenberg E, like the Black Press Born Digital Project, um, will be focused on creating uh, born digital books. The Gutenberg has focused on creating born digital books through Columbia, Columbia U University Press and Libraries. And the Black Press Born Digital uh, Project um, seeks to model that sort of relationship between a library, a scholar, and an academic university press. So that the Black Press Born Digital Project, part of its innovation, yes, is the digital element of it. But one of the things I've been very committed to all along is envisioning the academic library as a main conduit to publishing and disseminating born digital books. And as full disclosure, um, I used to work as a professional librarian and still see myself and see my work as both contributing to the advancement of the scholarship of the black press, but also to the advancement of the role of the library in digital and scholarly communication. I think that that has not, that still continues to be evolving and the library still continues to be under recognized in that, in that way. And so I think the model that most and best implements exemplifies the library at the center of academic publishing is the Michigan um, University of Michigan Library where the library acts as a hub of scholarly publishing. Now other academic libraries have also considered open access publishing and many have explored the publication of open access, access journals 
but the Black Press Born Digital Project wants to go beyond this idea and its effort to focus on short born digital monographs. And we're focusing on short as opposed to trying to develop a, a full length monograph because um, we think that the digital requires a different type of uh, monograph. Um, we don't think that the, the sort of uh, full monograph um, merits the uh, sort of attention or the consideration um, that the digital might bring to it. Um, we're also thinking about um, not necessarily the short attention spans of maybe a, a newer generations of students, but an attention span that um, wants to move around within a text and engage a text on a certain level. And, and we think that, you know, a short brevity lends itself to that. Um, so the Sheridan Library, and I'll come back again to that, is a big part of that. Um, and seeks to, with the Center for Africana D Studies, uh, create a set of di uh, a digital resource sur sources that will accompany these books. And so these books will act as, as digital por portals into um, each of these topics. So let me show you um, these books really quickly as I, uh, as I run out of time. Um, the first book is by Benjamin Fagan, who is a professor of English and assistant professor of English at um, Auburn University. And he's, his book is on transnational literature in the early black press. Um, I won't read the abstract, but in short, he looks at the early pages of black newspapers and is thinking critically about black newspapers allowing um, African Americans to stay connected to a series of broader transnational communities and he's looking at late 19th century black newspapers um, and looking at news coverage and will be um, using images from late 19th century newspapers to think about how short stories, illustrations, poems, and novels uh, invited readers to gaze beyond national borders. The next book is a book by me. Um, it's called Fiction for the Harassed and Frustrated, the short story tradition in the Baltimore Afro-American that looks at the literary tr tradition of the black press that's been forgotten by scholars. And so I'm reproducing 40 short fictional stories which were originally published in a collection called the Baltimore Afro, um, um, Best Short Stories by African-American Writers. Um, in the 19, um, between 1925 and 1950. And I have two images here that um, look, uh, that give you an idea of what those stories looked at. The next book is The Children of the Civil Rights Generation and the Chicago Defender. This book will look at columns um, that reflected new images of black childhood. This book is by Maura Hinder, Hinderer, who is a scholar of um, the Chicago Defender and African American Childhood. Um, and um, she's trying to think critically about how the African American press, specifically the Defender, developed the concept of, of African American ch childhood um, and urbanization and migration. And then finally, um, Imaging the Black Freedom Stru Struggle, Political Cartoons of Muhammad Speaks is by Kurum Hussein, who is a scholar at Hobart and, uh, and Smith Colleges, um, who looks at um, Muhammad Speaks and the political cartoons that were a part of the generation, the civil rights movement generation, the black power, black nationalistic generation between 1960 and 1975. Um, and he's arguing that these cartoons provided a distinct view of national and world events that impacted the lives of black Americans. So this project um, sees these uh, books and we'll develop these books in EPUB 3 software. We're still working out the, the best software for this project, but at this point we're thinking EPUB 3. Um, EPUB 3 uses the Dublin Core metadata, making it consistent with other metadata frameworks, which are used for films, audio, and images. Um, we're also hoping that these, um, these books will allow people to 
uh, you know, access video, access uh, uh, hyperlinks to other resources, um, will allow them to search um, and have and contain audio visual files. So we're looking to make these these projects as multimedia um, as possible and making them as widely a, a, as possible um, at this point. Um, at this point, the project represents a, a partnership, as I mentioned, between the Sheridan Libraries, right? And so I want to mention in closing some key people who are working with me on this project. Um, Greg Britton uh, at Johns Hopkins University Press, who's the editorial director, has signed on to the project and is committed to working with us to make these books accessible hopefully in Muse Open and, and, and thinking about publishing um, a print version. So as opposed to publishing a digital version, we're hoping and thinking about publishing print versions of these born digital books. Uh, Saeed Chowdhury, who's Associate Dean for Research Data Management, um, who has been instrumental from the very beginning with this project, is also at the helm of creating the digital um, part of this project and um, he again has been committed through Sheridan Libraries to seeing this project to fruition. Mark Sizek, who was the first person that I actually uh, conveyed this idea to, is a scholarly communication architect and will be the person responsible for designing the Born Digital books. Um, Chella Vajanathan uh, is uh, the curator of 19th and 20th century books, and she is working with me on the content and making these book, not, books not only accessible to the broader public, but also accessible to the Hopkins community. And uh, finally, but definitely not at least, Hannah Vu, who keeps the project running as a project manager and a software engineer, um, has been instrumental in spearheading the collaboration um, and the implementation of the collaboration, I should say, and keeping us all in communication together. So, you know, one of the most exciting prospects of the, the Black Press Born Digital Project is, a, is its ability to contribute to the growing number of voices urging tenure granting committees to place greater value on digital scholarship. And in this vein, I'm hoping to make these Black Press Born Digital books, um, you know, digital companions or companions to a lot of the other digital scholarship that we will see coming out in the near future. Um, and so we hope to demonstrate that digital humanistic work does not circumvent traditional modes of scholarship, but strengthens it and perhaps will be leading the way in the future. So again, I want to thank you for your time um, and your flexibility with allowing me to present via video recording. Um, and I look forward to working with uh, my colleagues who are also digital fellows and others who are also committed to digital innovation and digital scholarship in, in the future. Uh, thank you and good luck and have a great rest of the uh, meeting. Well, thanks very much to Kim, and I regret that we regret that she won't be able to be here for the discussion section. Our second presentation is by Brooke Danielle Lillehagen, who is the Assistant Professor of Linguistics at Haverford College, received her PhD in linguistics from UC Berkeley, and received the 2015 ACLS Fellowship for her project, a collection of Zapotec indigenous testaments in translation with linguistic analysis and annotation. The speakers of the Zapotec language, and mostly in Oaxaca State in southern Mexico, have had various kinds of alphabetic systems since 1565, most of which have remained opaque to scholars who have confined themselves primarily to working in the Spanish language. And Brooke is working with very early materials, particularly wills and testaments, as a way of structuring an accessible reference grammar. Not all re reference grammars are accessible. <laughs> for, for scholars who are interested in, and committed to broadening their scope beyond that, they can, they can find in the Spanish record. Also, to provide a text explorer so that various themes and issues can be pursued through the body of work that she's working with. So, Brooke, we have it. Thank you for the kind introduction. 
So I'm a linguist, and on one hand, the story of this work is that of linguistic analysis, taking a corpus of texts and holding the language up to a microscope. What is the structure of the text? How are sentences formed? How are words formed? How does the form of the language differ from that of how it's spoken today hundreds of years later? But one way, in this, pro one way this project might be unusual has to do with the corpus itself. The texts are written in Zapotec, an indigenous language of Mexico, and the corpus is of a substantial size. So far, we know of hundreds of handwritten manuscripts and thousands of pages of printed text created in the Mexican colonial period with the earliest text dating to 1565. To have such a large and old corpus of alphabetic text written in a language indigenous to the Americas is rare and exciting. But this corpus of text has been underutilized, partly because of the difficulty in accessing the text themselves, but even more so because of the challenges of accessing the language, which of course is something a linguist can intervene in. But as much as I love talking about grammar and prefixes and verb forms, um, what I want to talk about today is instead looking at the project while asking how questions of access and audience can shape the structure of a project. So with that in mind, I want to back up and give a little bit of context. Zapotec is a family of related languages spoken primarily in the southern state of Oaxaca, Mexico, as well as by immigrants in the United States. The state of Oaxaca itself is incredibly diverse linguistically. Some other languages spoken in the state are related to Zapotec, like Mixtec and Triqui, but others are unrelated, like Nahuatl and Wave. And this is just a pretty picture while I say the next part. <laughs> Zapotec is, in fact, a large, diverse family of languages. There may be as many as 400,000 speakers of Zapotec languages in total, though all Zapotec varieties are endangered in that they are losing speakers faster than they are gaining them and many Zapotec varieties are critically endangered and likely will cease to be spoken in the next 20 or 30 years as communities shift to speaking Spanish. Discrimination against speakers of Zapotec and other indigenous languages has a long history and continues even today. Here we see the 16th century church of Teotitlan del Valle, one of the towns in the valley of Oaxaca where the corpus of texts I'm working on is from. It was built on the site of a Zapotec temple and if you look closely, you can see that it includes pieces of the original temple in the walls. This church and its courtyard are the site of many important town-wide events today. And so I find this image particularly poignant when considering both the history and the actual state of languages in the valley. So before looking at the colonial texts and the language in an earlier form, I want to let you hear from two modern Zapotec speakers and even hear some Zapotec spoken. Maria Mercedes Mendez Morales is a teacher and a language activist, and here she's going to talk about the state of her language. She begins in Spanish and switches to Zapotec, and now I'll let her speak for herself. Mi nombre es Maria Mercedes Mendez Morales, de San Jerónimo, Tlacochahuaya, Tlacolula, Oaxaca. Estoy acá porque es importante para mí el rescate de mi lengua. Esto con la finalidad de que no se pierda la lengua zapoteca, que siento que está inmerso en un hilito que siento que se va a romper, pero que tengo que hacer algo por ella. ¿Qué más podría decir que, que mi lengua podría decir Grastecna, Graste de Buen, Buen Sun, Larutis, Suat, Larutis, Herbest? I bet for a lot of you that was the first time you heard Zapotec, right? <laughs> you hear her expressing the fragility of the language, comparing it to a thin thread, but you also hear her expressing her dedication to preserve the language and exhorting others to do the same. Janet Chavez Santiago reflects on her own experience with language discrimination and the effects it has had on her town, and in this case, I'll read her words. When I was in elementary school in the 90s, I remember children speaking Zapotec in many contexts, playing in the streets, at parties, and during town celebrations, but never at school. Instead, we had to behave ourselves by not speaking Zapotec. 
Otherwise, teachers could punish us by giving us extra homework or by not letting us eat lunch or even beating us. Teachers made us believe that speaking Zapotec was disrespectful, something to be ashamed of. They devalued our language by calling it a dialect. As a child, I never saw anything written in Zapotec. All my books and the books that my parents brought me, bought me were in Spanish. So at some point, I thought teachers were right. The Zapotec was a language with no value, so nobody wanted to write books in my language. By the end of the 90s, there was no need to prohibit children speaking Zapotec in the school, because in order to avoid children being punished, parents had switched to speaking in Spanish to the children at home. These days, very few children who speak, there are very few children who speak Zapotec in my town. So as referenced by Chavez, most speakers of Zapotec do not write their language, especially in the valley. But Zapotec, in fact, has a long history of writing, including non-alphabetic writing. And then there's the corpus of colonial Zapotec texts, alphabetic texts, that we'll now turn our attention to. The corpus includes metalinguistic texts, such as a dictionary and a grammar that we'll see an example from later on, and religious texts, including a bilingual doctrine of Catholic faith and of particular interest to me this year, a corpus of monolingual handwritten administrative texts written in Zapotec for local purposes, texts such as last wills and testaments and bills of sale. And this is where my ACLS funded work meets up with a larger digital scholarship project entitled Ticha. Ticha means word in Zapotec, but it also means language and text, so we thought it was apt here. And Ticha is a digital text explorer for colonial Zapotec and it's online and accessible now. The Teacher Project is a large, collaborative, interdisciplinary project with several academics, librarians, and undergraduate students involved. And in designing Teacher, we repeatedly find ourselves returning to the questions of access and audience. What aspects of the text need to be more accessible? What are effective ways to achieve that? Who might use the text, and how might they want to engage with them? There is an abundance of linguistic and historical information in these texts. But I won't focus on enumerating the ways scholars might want to use these texts because I suppose you all can do that for yourselves. So for today, I would rather focus on the question, how can we open up these texts both to academics and to Zapotec speakers, to an anthropologist interested in inheritance patterns, and to a Zapotec community member searching for a now forgotten word in Zapotec or for information on the history of her own town? To start to address that, we need to examine what barriers to access currently exist. The language, even in bilingual texts, is difficult for non-experts to understand. Even native Zapotec speakers cannot easily read the texts. Here's an example from the grammar I, re I referenced earlier, which seems like it ought to be fairly accessible. It's a list of numbers, with the headwords in Spanish, a translation in Zapotec, and an Arabic numeral. So for the entry for 138, I've put everything after the Spanish headword in red. But what does that mean? Is that whole part 138 in Zapotec? Well, maybe as a reader, we happen to know that the L is an abbreviation for Latin vel and means or. So perhaps we're looking at two ways to say 138, everything before the L and everything after the L. But in fact, we're looking at five ways to say 138. So it turns out that the comma between the first and second word is being used to indicate a choice between those two words, like a modern day slash. But that's not always the use of the comma in this text. So one really needs to understand Zapotec to understand the structure of the entry. Moreover, understanding the morphology of the Zapotec itself, that is the parts that make up the phrase, allow us to see a base 20 counting system at play, which isn't apparent just from the Spanish translation. So if we look at this first way to say 138, we see another five until 720s. So do a little math, right? So 140, another five until then, you're at 135 plus three more. <laughs> Access to the documents itself is not insignificant. The documents in the corpus are located in a range of archives, from national and state archives to smaller municipal archives or even personal collections. And unfortunately, some texts have already been lost to mold and in some cases even burned or destroyed. And sadly, deeply ingrained prejudice against indigenous people that means accessing archives themselves shouldn't be taken for granted. Many indigenous individuals have experienced actions aimed to intimidate them when seeking access to public services and buildings, including archives. 
Thus, we must facilitate access to the documents by providing high quality images on the project webpage. Along with metadata, which may also serve smaller archives which may not have a registry of their documents. And linguistic analysis, including transcriptions. The inventory of the documents is searchable in English and Spanish and navigable through a timeline. Publishing in a digital format allows us to address questions of access and audience in flexible ways. The texts are made publicly available on TICHA as soon as possible at any stage of analysis, even if all we have ready at the moment are images, because the acknowledgement of the existence of these texts is important to the community. It makes visible a written history of a language currently under threat. We utilize digital tools where they help us to provide access to the content in effective and flexible ways. I describe this work as digital scholarship as I'm doing here, but I always wish that there was a footnote to that. As not all aspects of a digital project are digital, neither in its creation nor its dissemination. The digital tools give us flexibility in providing access to diverse audiences, but where they don't, we should not be constrained by them. Digital encoding and presentation allows us to address not only questions of access, but also questions of a diverse audience, both in terms of academic disciplines, but also in terms of academic and non-academic audiences. Consider this page from Cordova's Grammar. There is a lot we know about this page. We can say things about structure, about content, about language, but most users wouldn't want to know everything that we know about this page, or at least not all at once. In this case, digital tools serve us well. We encode many aspects of the text behind the scenes and selectively pull from that for display. For example, we can present a version faithful to the original layout and in the early modern Spanish, complete with long S's and any abbreviations present in the original. Or pulling from the same encoding, we can present a version that ignores the original layout and shows a modernization of the Spanish. This, for example, was not originally a priority but was created in response to clear communication from non-academics that the early modern Spanish presented an unnecessary barrier to understanding the text. Morphological analysis of the Zapotec language can be accessed by clicking on the Zapotec words, allowing users to consult a linguist's perspective on the language when that would be useful to them. Thus, through the application of Technical disciplinary methods, combined with the, the utilization of wide-ranging tools for presentation of both materials and analysis, we intend to make this corpus accessible to a wide scholarly audience as well as non-academic audiences, hopefully resulting in increased use of the text, use of and research on these materials. And I want to thank these institutions and people for their support, especially the ACLS, both for the funding and for the invitation to be here today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brooke. And I've got to say, as a linguistic anthropologist, a few presentations can speak more directly to the heart. One of, one of the things I can say, actually, about all three of these presentations, and we'll just we'll get one more iteration on this theme, is these are signal demonstrations of the recovery of voices and of making it possible for voices to speak to diverse and more increasingly democratic audiences across the board. They again model good scholarship. Our final speaker is Michael Penn, who's a William Keenan Jr. Professor of Religion at Mount Holyoke College, received his PhD at Duke in, in Religious Studies, and received a Frederick Burkhart Residential Fellowship for recently tenured scholars in 2011. Not all of our titles are that long. The, um, his project at that time was Syriac Christian Reactions to the Rise of of Islam, and in his presentation, we've been sort of moving archaeologically through the strata from the 19th and 20th centuries, back beginning with the 16th. We're now going back a millennium, más o menos, um, before that. One of the, the challenges that, that Michael, as, as a scholar who works in the Aramaic dialect of, of Syriac, is very few scholars can read the Aramaic dialect of Syriac, apart from those within Syriac communities. And what makes the text he's working with particularly important is these are early Aramaic 
accounts of encounters with Islam among the very first encounters with Muslims in the Christian world and really moving our understanding of those crucial interactions and of the shaping of the two traditions in relation to each other back in time. So let me turn things over to Michael. In 1993, a foreign affairs article popularized the phrase clash of civilizations. Now, rarely can one so easily quantify in academics effect on the popular imagination. According to the periodical database Nexus, prior to 1993, the phrase clash of civilizations was used by 11 sources. <laughs> In the seven years after 93, that jumped to 625. Post 9-11, it skyrocketed to over 5,000. Now, originally this phrase was used to speak of 11 alleged civilization groups. And one might expect that these 11 groups would be given equal airtime. In practice, this was decidedly not the case. Initially, one third of the time when a clashing civilization group was specified, it was Islam. Post 9-11, Islam now constitutes 68% of the references. The result is a dualistic worldview in which a homogenous entity called Islam inevitably clashes with an equally entrenched entity, often simply called the West. <clears throat> Recently published, widely read hate literature frequently builds on this paradigm. To quote from a particularly egregious example, the politically incorrect guide to Islam claims to give you all the information you need to understand the true nature of the global conflict that America faces today. Such information includes that Islam is a religion of war, it is also profoundly a religion of intolerance, and that throughout its history, Islam has never even tolerated non-Muslims. Coincidentally, uh, this book was ranked at the top 0.1% of Amazon.com sales and for three years was their best seller in the category Islamic history. Now, I doubt that historical scholarship will eliminate the popularity of books such as The Myth of Islamic Tolerance, Christians, Muslims, and Islamic Rage, or Islam unveiled. But I do think that historians can challenge the reigning view that throughout time, Christianity and Islam inevitably and always clash. It is here where texts in a little studied Aramaic dialect of Syriac become particularly valuable. Let me explain. When most folks study early Christianity, these studies usually fall in the confines of that map. That is, early Christianity is seen as a religion of the Mediterranean basin, whose geographic expanse is coextensive with the Roman Empire, and whose literature was written in Greek and Latin. But as the second map illustrates, early Christians didn't live solely in the Roman Empire, nor did they live solely in the Mediterranean basin, nor did they write solely in Greek and Latin. Of particular importance for my Burkhart project, we're Syriacs, or excuse me, Christians in northern Mesopotamia, who live in what would be modern day Iran, Iraq, Syria, and eastern Turkey. In general, these Christians did not write in Greek and Latin, but rather in the lingua franca of the late ancient Middle East, that dialect of Syriac. As a result, when Muslims first met Christians, they did not first meet Latin-speaking Christians from the Western Mediterranean, nor Greek-speaking Christians from Constantinople, but rather Syriac speakers from Northern Mesopotamia. 
these Syriac Christians were under Muslim rule from the mid-7th century up to the present, and they wrote the earliest, largest, and most diverse set of Christian accounts of early Islam. Nevertheless, because so few modern scholars read Syriac, there's been relatively little analysis of these sources. And as a result, most historical reconstructions of the interactions of Christians and Muslims focus on works whose martial context often reinforces an oppositional model of interreligious encounters. But members of these Syriac churches had a very different experience of Islam than did most Greek and Latin Christians. In the Islamic empire, Syriac Christians held key governmental positions, attended the caliph's court in Baghdad, collaborated with Muslim scholars to translate Greek philosophy and science into Arabic, accompanied Muslim leaders on campaigns against the Byzantines, and helped fund monasteries through donations from Muslims including money from the caliph himself. Syriac Christians ate with Muslims, married Muslims, bequeathed estates to Muslim heirs, taught Muslim children, and were soldiers in Muslim armies. The Burkhart Fellowship let me ask, what would happen if instead of relying on the writings from Christians who often met Muslims on the battlefield, one focused on these Syriac Christians who inhabited a world in which they had daily interactions with Muslims and a much more direct experience of Islam than did most Western Christians. My project synthesized data from over 50 Syriac documents that were written between the mid 7th and the mid 9th century CE. For example, the earliest manuscript Whoever mentioned Muhammad, you can see here. It is a Syriac flyleaf written just a couple of years after the prophet's death. And it provides an eyewitness account to the Islamic conquests. As an indicator of how infrequently Syriac texts are consulted, to the best of my knowledge, only five people alive today have ever looked at the earliest manuscript page mentioning Islam. And you are among the first to see this multispectral image that's able to make it more readable. So too, image processing algorithms originally developed to analyze the spotting pattern of frog skin. I'm not making that up. <laughs> We're able to bring up some additional details. Now move a few decades later and consider a better preserved text. In this case, the best seller of the seventh century, now known as Pseudo-Methodius, quickly translated into Greek, Armenian, Slavonic, and now still preserved in over 200 surviving Latin manuscripts. Its prophecies regarding Islam's imminent demise were even printed in Vienna during the Turkish siege of 1683. To get a quick overview of its content, peruse this colorful word cloud that indicates frequency by font size. The more common the word, the larger the font. Note the prevalence of terms such as devastated, chastisement, and destruction. Now consider a very different perspective the legal decisions of the late 7th century bishop, Jacob of Edessa. For example, one day Jacob's friends asked him what he should do with a Christian woman who is married to a Muslim husband who threatens to kill a priest if the priest doesn't give his Christian wife the Eucharist. <laughs> Try to keep that straight. <laughs> In another letter, Jacob states that when in Byzantine territories, some Muslims had stolen the Eucharist elements. Once these soldiers returned to Muslim territory, 
They felt so badly about their theft that they brought the pilfered elements to Jacob, who essentially had no idea what to do with them whatsoever. Now let's add some other details, such as closing church doors prior to the Eucharist, so that Muslims might not enter and mingle with believers. Decisions about whether a Christian abbot can accept a dinner invitation from a Muslim governor. Jacob encouraging priests to accept hire as teachers for Muslim children, and a ruling that priests can exercise demon-possessed Muslims, and even use a mixture of Christian holy water and relics to perform such healings. This intermingling becomes so prevalent that Jacob must even rule that a cloth embroidered with a Muslim confession of faith cannot be reused as a Christian altar covering. Now, finally, let's jump a century and quickly consider Timothy I, who headed the medieval world's largest church. From 780 CE to 823, Timothy attended the court of four Muslim caliphs and with their support, expanded the Syriac church throughout the Middle East into India, Afghanistan, Tibet, and China. Personally commissioned by the caliph to translate Aristotle into Arabic, the trilingual Timothy once even accompanied the caliph on a military campaign against the Byzantines. In his writings, Timothy quotes from a number of Quranic passages to prove Muhammad's belief in Christ. For example, Timothy quotes a number of verses in the Quran that use the first person plural to speak of God. According to Timothy, these we passages are of course references to God and Christ. So too, Timothy correctly points out that a number of Quranic verses begin with a series of mystical, untranslatable letters. Timothy incorrectly states that these always come as groups of three in order to claim that they are secret references to the Christian Trinity. According to Timothy, in Muhammad's day, the Arabs could not handle the truth. <laughs> that is, they were so closely aligned with polytheism, they would have in inevitably misinterpreted the Trinity. So Muhammad, as a good crypto-Christian, encoded such knowledge in the Quran for future generations. Now, although few of us would consider these to be particularly persuasive arguments, they do show a level of engagement with Islamic sources, unknown among early, more Western Christians. The Burkhart, Project, the Burkhart Fellowship gave me the amazing opportunity, not simply to find and research sources such as these, but also to disseminate my findings in two complementary forms. The first, Envisioning Islam, is a University of Pennsylvania Press monograph that moves from the teasers and sound bites I've given you today to a much fuller analysis of what early Syriac texts can teach us about the first encounters of what will eventually become the modern world's two largest religions. The second, when Christians first met Muslims, is a University of California Press source book that includes my introductions and translations of the earliest of these sources to make them accessible to readers that are scholars and researchers alike. Now, do forgive the lightning speed summary of these works, but I want to give you at least a taste of a project that quite literally would not have come into being were it not for the ACLS's support. I also wanted to showcase the diversity of Syriac discussions of Muslims ranging from overtly antagonistic 
to downright friendly. This diversity makes it really hard to construct a 15-minute presentation that's easy to summarize. <laughs> but it makes it very easy to contest any depiction of a monolithic Christian reaction to Islam. Even more challenging to reductionist models of interreligious encounters is the amorphous nature of what we call Islam. Syriac texts constantly suggest that in the first centuries after Muhammad's death, there was much greater hybridity and overlap between the categories Christian and Muslim than is commonly acknowledged. They show that for centuries, Christianity and Islam exhibited way too much permeability, interdependence, and convergence to be defined as firmly bound independent entities, say the least, as inevitably clashing civilizations. Thank you. So we now have 15 minutes to open the floor up for heterogeneous voices. Um, to the extent I can see through the glare, I will recognize people. Any questions for either of our panelists? Yes, please. I'm Vivian. Is this working? No? Yes, okay. Um, Vivian Curran from um, the American uh, um, Society of Comparative Law. And I was, um, thank you for your wonderful um, presentations. And I wanted to address my question to Professor Lillehagen. Um, I loved your presentation on um, the, um, I'm trying to come up with the name uh, of, the, of the language, but it reminded me of a book I had read a number of years ago written by, uh, co-authored by a linguist and an anthropologist called Vanishing Voices. And one of the things that was a theme of this book was the, among the themes of this book was that these languages which disappear um, such as the language that you describe, or which are, are in, in a danger of disappearing, and which are disappearing at a vast, vast rate, um, are analogous to um, the loss in biodiversity that we're seeing on Earth. And I wondered if you had ever reflected on that and would like to comment on that. Thank you for your, for your question. Um, yes, that, that analogy between linguistic diversity and biodiversity is, is something that is really strong in the endangered language field. In fact, you often find ling linguistic diversity in areas of biodiversity, and that certainly is the case in Oaxaca. So not only is it a, a place with enormous language diversity, but it's also a, a place of biodiversity. One way I can respond to this is something that we've been interested in doing is looking at ethnobiology and looking at how these threatened languages name and categorize their threatened biosphere. So this is a way of documenting indigenous knowledge, both in terms of the language and in terms of the biodiversity that's also disappeared. Other questions? Yes, please. Oh, I'm Sally Hillsman. I'm Sally Hillsman, the American Sociological Association. Um, this is for Professor Penn. Your initial book was written in 2005, as I believe you indicated. And I wonder if you have any um, knowledge about or evidence for whether it has, over the following decade, had any impact not just on scholarship, but rather on public attitudes or public um, 
uh, definitions of the current, in the current era for relationships um, that perhaps are not clashes of civilization. Um, I know that uh, scholarship doesn't always move that quickly into the public square, but I wonder whether you have any evidence whether your work has. Thank you. The, the actual works in my study on Christian reactions to Islam um, actually came out last summer, so it's still kind of too early to hear. So I did, um, my initial research was very far removed from this. My first book project um, was called Kissing Christians. Um, it dealt with ritual kissing in early Christianity, um, which was a different topic. But <laughs> believe it or not, there are some links methodologically between them. Um, what I have been encouraged, even in kind of the first reactions to the, the summer publications, um, is to see the initial results of those interventions, not yet in the scholarly journals. Like I have not yet, just because of the timing of journals, received scholarly reviews, but rather in some crossover publications in the blogosphere. Um, so it is very nice to see that these are getting out in certain ways. Um, earlier articles of these that kind of led up to the book also had some interesting crossover. I had an email a few years ago from a scholar in Iran who was translating one of my, um, a chapter from an edited volume of that into um, Farsi. And you know, I was a little bit concerned what this might mean for copyright law because I'm really happy to have it be disseminated as far as possible. And he explained to me that they weren't quite as concerned about that in Iran. <laughs> um, but it was very interesting for me to see how that disseminated in ways that I could never imagine. So I'm going to have to get back to you maybe in a few years in terms of how this current work gets disseminated. But it always surprises me um, the way that this gets transmitted outside of just our more formal avenues of academic review. Thank you. Um, three, three wonderful talks. Uh, and uh, if I had time, uh, I'd have questions for all three. Um, but I'd like to ask a question of, of Brooke um, about the balance between the preservation of, the lang of, of a language like Zapotec uh, in the records uh, and its vitality amongst uh, speakers. And the reason, wh what I have in mind is, um, you know, the, the, the truism amongst linguists is that languages are dying at the rate of a, a couple a week. Um, and, and so preserving the language, it seems to me, is in many instances futile. Um, uh, of course, our, our, our inclination very strongly is to preserve it um, and, and, and to keep it alive. But it takes such large communities to do that, uh, as in the case, let's say, of Welsh. And of, of course, there's the extraordinary case of Hebrew and so forth, uh, which has been revived. But my question is, how does someone like you think about the, the recording of the language so that we have whatever is available uh, and, and the keeping of that language uh, alive uh, amongst uh, current speakers? That's a very big question. <laughs> but, but let me say a few things to that. Um, first of all, as a linguist, there's nothing I can do to save a language or keep a language alive. I can be an ally for communities that, that wish to change the trajectory of their language. And then in terms of what can be done, I think we have to look at why communities are shifting to another language. Because communities can be bilingual. Communities can be multilingual. So it doesn't have to be a choice between Zapotec or Spanish. So why is a choice felt? And one reason in the case of Zapotec is discrimination. People suffer for speaking their language and people perceive economic and social benefits to speaking only Spanish, that is, to not be seen speaking Zapotec. In Mexico, indigenous identity works a little differently than in the United States. People usually don't self-identify as indigenous unless they speak the language. So people may see things, say things like, my parents are Zapotec, meaning that they don't speak Zapotec and so they don't identify as Zapotec. And so one thing an allied linguist can do is can look at ways where people are suffering prejudice, and one case in this, in this language is the lack of 
written. People are saying it's not a real language because it's not written. And here I can make visible, it is a real language for many reasons, but it also has a written record, even though that's not a requirement to being a real language, it is a point of pride. Time for at least one more question in the back. Hi, I'm Laura Mitchell, I'm representing the World History Association, and uh, my question is also for Brooke. Um, I'd really like to hear you comment on the political, the um, logistical, and the funding decisions to have the teacher project um, hosted on a Haverford site as opposed to something in Mexico or something more removed from the academy. What was the last part or something? More removed from the academy. I mean, what's the, I think the site's fabulous. While you were talking, I had a chance to look at it, but I'm sure there were decisions going into why is the site hosted at Haverford and not someplace else, and I'd really be interested in hearing about that. I would say the main reason is funding. So I joined Haverford four years ago, and there was a digital humanities funding available at that time. And we have a digital scholarship support in the library that is incredible, that I understand that not all, not all universities have. We have de dedicated digital scholarship librarians who support this kind of work. And so I had the infrastructure and the funding available to do this and the commitment from the college to maintain it. In fact, Teacher now has its own server at Haverford, which is really unusual for a small college, so I've been very, very well supported by them. Also, funding for the project and for my own work has mainly come from US funding sources. Although we apply to Mexican funding sources, they don't have the same depth of resources available. Um, we are in conversations with having partnerships with, with universities, particularly the UNAM in Mexico City, where we might have a parallel site, um, but in terms of having it hosted at Haverford, it doesn't prevent access from, from anywhere in the world. What we have to make sure, for example, is that we have Spanish interface and, and that we keep it free. We can't have a paywall because, and I think in this case it would be unethical given the nature of the materials. We have to make sure that it's available to Zapotec speakers. One more question. Yes, back in the middle. Um, I'm Susan Ackerman from the American Schools of Oriental Research. Um, my question is for Professor Penn, and I'm wondering about whether you've thought uh, within early Christianity about comparative aspects of your work. I'm so struck that there are questions of whether early Jewish Christians can eat with Gentiles and things like that that seem so parallel to the questions you're asking. Yes. Um, well. The quick answer is yes. A little bit more on that. One thing that has been extremely important for me in terms of even the sound bites you're getting about the strong overlap between Christianity and Islam is based over the last few decades on similar research and conclusions made about relations between Christians and Jews within the first few centuries of the Common Era. So that sort of scholarship has been extremely influential. One of the things that's occasionally hard for me with my project is to explain it to some folks outside of my field. That is, my office, I have a scholar on the right of my office who's a Buddhologist, a scholar on the left who's a specialist in Jainism. And when I come to them and say, I have this amazing discovery. I found two religious communities that actually interact with each other. <laughs> they look at me and say, you can publish that? <laughs> and part of it, and this is also analogous to the study of Jewish Christian relations up to about two decades ago is that there is both a very strong tradition in the, these religious communities of very strong religious and definitional boundaries, but also an equally strong tradition in 19th and 20th century scholarship that sees them as being so distant from each other. And I would argue, as I did in the beginning of my talk, a much more popular imagination of very separate civilizations from each other where to actually say what for most scholars of lived religion is bloody obvious, that communities living in the same place are always interacting and you can't make these clear de definitional boundaries, is actually news within these fields. And so again, the, the scholarship over the last decades that made similar discoveries 
of Christian Jewish relations has been really foundational for the sort of work. There are other ways that I interact with comparative work, um, but that's just uh, some first reactions to that. So thank you for the question. Thanks very much, and thanks to all of you. Um, let me invite you to a reception outside to celebrate our speakers today and the, the pleasures of being here. <laughs>